Hey guys, this is Holy Roots Ministry here. Today we're going to speak about worship and confession and what the world talks about and how they teach worship and confession versus what the Bible teaches and what it's always taught for the last few centuries. Um, most American pastors and churches are critically failing people and they're leading them astray for their own selfish desire for popularity and wealth. Many people have been led astray to believe that they can live like the world or in the middle and still be true Christians. But this isn't true. We will briefly expound on what God's word says about true worship and confession of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll start off with Psalms 29.2. It says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It puts a pretty big thing on holiness there, and that's how we worship him. Um, worship, it's not just what you do when you go to church or what you see with wicked groups like Hillsong United, where the emphasis is on music, lighting, and entertainment, and being biblical is completely disregarded. But instead, it's a lifestyle. In John uh, chapter 4, verses 23 through 24, it says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As previously mentioned, it's a lifestyle. It's a consistent and righteous one. It won't be what you see in most of our society, where they go to church weekly and it's worshiping verbally, but then they go back to their regular wicked lives afterwards. But it says it's the antithesis, it's the opposite. Um, we used to be reading Matthew 15, 8. It says, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. It's speaking about, this is Jesus speaking. And honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. So God doesn't want a weekend warrior, but he demands true followers and servants who will die to their own will and live for his holiness in every aspect of their lives. Like again, you just heard the verse that talks about how God says, that people were saying with their mouth, but their actions weren't showing. Their fruits weren't showing. There was nothing there. As Romans 12, verses 1 through 2 reads, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself as living, your bodies as living sacrifice, excuse me, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. By God's mercy, we're able to present ourselves as, as a holy living sacrifice to God Almighty. And that's our reasonable service, or as the newer translations say, worship. And for true believers to not be conformed to this world and to this wicked ways, but to instead conform our minds to the perfect will of God and his ways. And we know that God's ways in the world, they're in conflict, they're the exact opposite. So you either focus on and choose God or it's the world and Satan. There is no in between. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 6 through 9 reads, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon his name. Excuse me, upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Although I'll be discussing confessing Christ now, the result of this teaching will help, it'll help illustrate more as worship and confessing Christ. They actually go hand in hand. It's not just where it's just one separate from the other. They're both... They're both tied together, just as our walk in Christ is. Um, when we see in confessing Christ truly, we read Romans 10, 9. It says that thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shall be saved, right? But what does this verse really mean? Because now we hear this verse and other verses similar and pastors and churches are pushing. That's all you have to do. Just verbally say something. But we read earlier in Matthew, that's not the case, right? That you have to, they're confessing with their mouths verbally, as the text says this now, but they're not actually 
they're not they're far from him they're not actually doing they don't really mean what they're saying right so we're going to read that the actions and the fruit go together with verbs back up um so we're going to read in a second so when you confess christ oh, excuse me when you hear pastors and, and churches just professing christians talking about verses like these where it says confess christ and you'll be saved but so they, they fail to go further to explain what it really means but instead they just misrepresent the scriptures and they lead people foolishly to believe that you can just be as you are and you can still be Christian. Because again, they're just worried about the attendance and the money, the revenue. But we'll read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 27, what Jesus says. He says, Into ye into this at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth into life, and few be there that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruit ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, right? Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have done cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, which is wickedness. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not should be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, did you catch that the verse in, through 21 through 23? I'm, I'm going to read it one more time just to make sure. Not that everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name, and thy name cast out devils, and that in, that in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. People call upon his name, and he professes that he never knew them because they weren't really saved. Not only does he, he do this with them, but he's also doing it with people who cast out demons and did great acts in his name, right? And, and, and another critical part is to notice that he says, many will say unto him. He doesn't say a couple or a few. He says, many. Let that sink in for a second. And just as he explains how many take the path, the broad path of evil and destruction, while there's only a few, a few that will take the narrow path of righteousness, not righteousness and life, excuse me. And not to mention, don't forget the verse as well, where he talks about not the ones who just saith, Lord, to him, but the ones that doeth the will of his Father in heaven. The works, the fruits go hand in hand with the, with the, the verbs, the confessing, the faith. You can't have faith without fruit, without the works. It's not possible, right? And so, of course, are you saved by that? Of course not. But we'll, we'll get into that in a second. So we, we see in Luke 4, 8, where Jesus answers and says unto them, Get behind me, Satan. Excuse me. <clears throat> For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Confessing Jesus Christ as Lord means to serve him in everything, as one serves their Lord or Master, because that's exactly what he is. If someone isn't dying to themselves daily, excuse me, and living for Jesus Christ, they're not worthy of him. We read in Matthew 10, 38, when Jesus tells them, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Is one saved by works? Of course not. However, works are a byproduct of salvation. And what I mean by that is 
Salvation in Jesus Christ will, pro will produce again a righteous lifestyle, a consistent lifestyle, requiring one to seek God's will and not your own, not your own selfish agenda. We read in James 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, it says, What doth it profit, profit, excuse my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed, and be filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which you are needful, which are needful to the body. What doth the prophet profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So it needs to be done. Everything we say, think, or do, or walk in Christ, glorifying Him. Colossians three fourteen through seventeen says, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bondness of perfect. I mean, the bond of perfect. Perfectness, excuse me, perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also you are the called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so whatsoever ye do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Every single aspect of a Christian's life needs to point to Christ and be founded on him. So many times I hear about people who are supposed to be Christian, yet there's not many things in Christ that point to Christ in their lives. And they choose to keep him separated from certain parts of their lives, like work, relationships, etc., but this can't be so. A true believer is founded on God and his word. And it has to be present in every aspect of their lives. They won't be ashamed. Whoever is ashamed of Christ will be ashamed of them in the times. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is critical because it even breaks down eating or drinking. And this is something that we all do on such a nanoscopic level, such a small level, we all eat and drink is the smallest thing you could possibly do every day. And he even tells you at such, such a minute level, such a small level, to glorify him in every single thing you do. Which is so any basic small thing that you can't downplay, you can't water it down and say, oh, that won't matter. God won't care about that. No, he's telling you right now he does. You don't care about that and you're seeking your own agenda. And that's a problem with true Christianity and true Christians versus the world that we see today. Um, as we discussed a couple weeks ago, God doesn't listen to the wicked, but to the righteous. Um, Psalms 4.3 reads, But know that the Lord has set him apart, that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, it means that you love him with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. We read in Mark 12, verses 28-31, through it says, One of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these not only does one have to have a righteous lifestyle you're supposed to set yourself apart from the world and surround yourself by others who also share the righteousness of christ not the wicked of the world psalms 1 reads blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly which is the world nor standeth in the way of the sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate on day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not weather, wither, excuse me, and whatsoever he do shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which is in the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sin is in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, 
but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Even secular people understand this. And generally, they'll say something around, show me the people you hang around, and I'll show you who you are. There's so much scripture about being set apart from the wicked. Yeah, preaching the gospel is one thing, but not to be close friends with them. This guy needs the gospel, he needs the light, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna give it to him, right? But I'm not gonna be best buds with him, kicking him every day, somebody who's against God, right? What does that say about me? And there's so much scripture about this. But yeah, if we truly con confess Jesus Christ with our hearts and minds, it's gonna reflect through our words and actions as well. They're all gonna be together. It's all gonna work, fit perfectly. We read in Ephesians 2, 10, it says, we, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We always see so many church signs and websites, and they come say, come as you are, right? And that is, that's, that's fine. But we, when we, we see so many that say, Jesus loves you just as you are, and as though Jesus does love you, it's, this is very unbiblical, biblical, excuse me, because it's very incomplete and misleading. Because, of course, Jesus loves us all and he forgives us if we repent from our wicked ways. But it requires just that. He loves us, but he hates our sinful, our sinful and evil ways, our wickedness. And he requires us to repent from our past self, to die to our old self and have a change in my heart and mind so we can truly be saved and forgiven. Hence the reason you said I'll, I'll get to that in a second, actually. Ephesians chapter 4 Verses 17, 17 to 24, excuse me, <clears throat> says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling that given themselves into lasciviousness, excuse me, <clears throat> to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If so, be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye be put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness." Now, does this mean that we'll be perfect? Of course not. But it does mean that we'll seek perfection and live a consistent, righteous lifestyle. So we may fail and sin here or there, but we won't be living in sin as the world. Significant difference. Another verse about confessing Christ, and arguably the most known Christian verse throughout the world and most misrepresented, is probably John 3.16. Let's examine it in the next few verses as well, like afterwards, to grasp the context and the actual meaning of the scripture. So we'll read John 3.16, but we're going to read it through verse 21. So it's, it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil, listen to this, hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds shall be reproved. But that he that trueth I mean, excuse me, that doeth true, doeth truth, cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they were wrought in God. And this verse correlates with 1 John chapter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, how a true believer, how you're, how you're going to really be if you're truly confessing Jesus Christ with your heart, mind, and soul. And if you believe, believe is an action, just like confessing or calling upon his name. Um, so we read 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. It says, that which ye we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, 
that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. A critical text again. And notice how it informs us the difference of someone who walks in darkness and says they have fellowship with Christ and how it tells us they are lying rather than the one who walks in the light and they're the ones who's cleansed from all sin, right? Truly forgiven, true salvation. How can we say we love God when we reject him for our own selfish agenda? I don't want to lose my job, uh, my relationship, my popularity, etc. Right? Um, uh, this one... Or when then, then you try to justify your wicked actions. Uh, I do this and that godly over there. I don't need to overdo it and have everything godly. God wouldn't want this. No, you don't want it. You, you're being icked, wicked. Excuse me. And if, you, if you're persecuted, so be it. Does God not tell us that we will be persecuted? He doesn't say we might or we could be. He says we will. To confess Christ is to die to yourself. And live for God. Revelation 3, 15 through 20 it reads, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, I mean cold nor hot. I would thou were I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with the eye slave, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. We have to give up everything and submit to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We can't just go halfway. We can't give him a part. We can't just go on the be on the fence and be like, okay, this is good enough. We have to be all in or you're nothing. God's not going to take it any other way as we read the scriptures. So confessing Jesus Christ with your life or calling upon his name and believing, it's going all in. It's of course, doing, as you do the scriptures, right? You call upon the name of Jesus with all your heart, mind, and soul. It has to be genuine, 100% in for Christ. And then if you truly do that, you have to repent, right? And repenting means, again, dying to your old self. Change your mind, change your heart, change your new, change a new, a new self. And that allows you to do that. And then, of course, your fruits will show. And then, of course, the righteousness will show. Um, I'm going to read a couple minute excerpt real quick from David Platt and um, the East his book Radical and the, te the teachings of Jesus Christ that's biblical, and the things we're talking about now versus the distorted version that's so heavily seen in America. Um, here we go. So David Platt says, the events of Luke 9 were not isolated. They weren't isolated events or incidents in the life of Jesus. On another occasion, when surrounded by a crowd of eager followers, Jesus turned to them and remarked, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Imagine hearing those words from an obscure Jewish teacher in the first century. He just lost most of us at hello. But then he continued, Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now this is taking it to another level. Pick up an instrument of torture and follow me. This is getting plain weird and kind of creepy. Imagine a leader coming onto the scene today and inviting all who would come after him to pick up an electric chair and become his disciple. Any takers? As if this was not enough, Jesus finished his seeker-sensitive plea with a pull at your heartstrings conclusion. Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Give up everything you have, carry a cross, and hate your family. This sounds a lot different than admit, believe, confess, and pray a prayer after me. And that's still not all. 
Consider Mark 10, another time a potential follower showed up. Here was a guy who was young, rich, and intelligent, and influential. He was a prime prospect, to say the least. Not only that, he was eager and ready to go. He came running up to Jesus, bowed at his feet, and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? If we were in Jesus' shoes, we'd probably be thinking this is our chance. A simple pray this prayer, sign this card, bow your head, and repeat after me. And this guy is in. Then think about what a guy like this with all his influence and prestige can do. We can get him on the circuit. He can start sharing his testimony, signing books, raising money for the cause. He can start. Yeah, so this one is a no brainer and we have to get him in. Unfortunately, Jesus didn't have the personal evangelism books we have today that tells us how to draw the net and close the sale. Instead, Jesus told him one thing. Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. What was he thinking? Jesus had committed the classic blunder of letting the big fish get away. The cost was too high. Yet the kind of abandonment Jesus asked of the rich young man is at the core of Jesus' invitation throughout the Gospels. Even his simple call on Matthew 4 to his disciples, follow me, contained radical implications for, the, for their lives. Jesus was calling them to abandon their comforts, all that was familiar to them and natural for them. He was calling them to abandon their careers. They were reorienting their entire life work around discipleship to Jesus. Their plans and dreams were now being swallowed by his. Jesus was calling them to abandon their possessions. Drop your nets and your trades as successful fishermen is what he was saying in effect. Jesus was calling them to abandon their family and their friends. When James and John left their father, we see Jesus' words in Luke 14 coming alive. Ultimately, Jesus was calling them to abandon themselves. They were leaving, uncertain, they were leaving certainty for uncertainty, safety for danger, self-preservation for self-denunciation. In a world that prizes promoting oneself, they were following a teacher who told them to crucify themselves. And the history tells us the result. Almost all of them will lose their lives because they responded to his invitation. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of these, eagerly follow, these eager followers of Jesus in the first century. What if I were a potential disciple being told to drop my nets? What if you were the man whom Jesus told not to even say goodbye to his family? What if you, we were told to hate our families and give up everything we had in, our, in order to follow Jesus? This is where we come face to face with a dangerous reality. We do have to give up everything we have to follow Jesus. We do have to Love him in a way that makes our closest relationships in this world look like hate. And it's entirely possible that he will tell us to sell everything we have and give it to the poor. But we don't want to believe it. We're afraid of what it might mean for our lives. So we rationalize these passages away. Jesus really wouldn't want us or tell us not to bury our father or say goodbye to our family. Jesus literally didn't mean to sell all we have and give it to the poor. What Jesus really meant was, and this is where we need to pause, because we're starting to redefine Christianity. We're giving in to the dangerous temptation to take the Jesus of the Bible and twist them into a version of Jesus that we're more comfortable with. A nice, middle-class American Jesus. A Jesus who doesn't mind materialism and who would never call us to give away anything we have. Or everything we have, excuse me. A Jesus who would not expect us to forsake our closest friend relationships so that he receives all our affection. A Jesus who is fine with nominal devotion that is not infringed on our comforts because after all, he loves us just the way we are. A Jesus who wants us to be balanced, who wants us to avoid dangerous extremes, and who, for that matter, wants us to avoid danger altogether. A Jesus who brings us comfort and prosperity as we live our Christian spin on the American dream. But do you and I realize what we're doing at this point? We are molding Jesus into our image. He's beginning to look, look a lot like us because after all, that's who we're most comfortable with. The danger now is that when we gather in our church buildings to sing and lift up our hands and worship, we may not actually be worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. Instead, we may be worshiping ourselves. And although I might not agree with all of his philosophy, this, this assessment was spot on, it was profound. 
and it shows the truth of our wicked self-seeking culture that loves pleasure over God and honor and how we distort that to try to make both fit in or we try to sway or go around the truth of what the matter really is. Uh, I have basic principles for true confession in Christ and basically it's these following eight. So you have being genuine. Like I said, the confessing has to be genuine when you call upon the name of Christ. It can't be a 50%, 60, 80, 10. It has to be all in. You have to wholehearted, all your might, all your soul, as we read in the scriptures earlier. You have to have the humility and selflessness to die to yourself and to seek him. That's, it's absolutely critical. You can't seek God if you're prideful and wicked. You have to have the humility. Um, another one is devotion. You have to be completely devoted to Christ. There has to be the devotion there that you seek him and you're devoted to following him in all of his ways. Um, another one is obedience. You have to be obedient to his word. You can't say you love him, but yet you follow your own, right? And you do your own thing. Another one is commitment, which is pretty similar to devotion. You have to be committed to Christ. No matter what comes your way, you're going to face it. You're going to rely on Christ no matter what. There is no back, there's no backlash. There's no going away or being offended because of what you're facing because of God or because it's not going the way you want it. Again, it's not about you. It's dying to self is huge. The loyalty as well, which is, goes pretty close hand in hand with commitment. And then, of course, honor. If you love God, you're going to honor him. You're going to be honorable. You're going to be righteous. Like I said, you're going to mess up here and there. But you're seeking perfection and righteousness in Christ. Not your own wicked selfishness that you used to have back in the day. It's a totally being founded in God and seeking him only. Um, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer stated, the call is to abandon the attachments of this world. You have to abandon everything, leave it all. And seek only God. He is the only thing that matters. Nothing else is everything else is irrelevant. Nothing else matters. And once you understand that, you get you receive the peace. And you'll know if you're truly a Christian, honestly. That the you you'll you'll lose that darkness, you lose the emptiness that you felt beforehand, and you have the peace and the joy of God that you never experienced ever. Um, but again, another critical thing right here, which I'll use as my conclusion, is John 14, 15. It's, it's beautiful, it's really short, but it's it's concise, it's to the point. And then Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love God, your words won't be empty. As we read in the scriptures earlier in Matthew, where he says, you're, you, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. If you love him, it's going to show. Again, your fruit will be there. You can't say you love God, but you're living for yourself. And then you're justifying it and trying to mix and rationalize your scriptures rather than just living for God and rejecting yourself. Because we, we were once wicked. And um, so, yeah, I'm just going to end it with a prayer real quick, and then we'll be good to go. And um, thank you, Lord God, so much for your blessings every single day, Lord, that we can never deserve, not even a percent of them. We praise your name always, no matter whatever comes our way, because even when we face trials and tribulations, we know that you blessed us to even be able, to, alive, to have breath to face those. We pray that you continue to open people's eyes, Lord God, plant seeds. Let your word be done and let your will be done, my Lord. That we seek you only and no one else, not ourselves, not our own agendas. Nothing else matters. We praise you and we love you so much. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.